that's so anonymous to the no, I can't do that. Like and subscribe. Not so anonymous from Ize Eureka. This podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Village Sports at 941 West Pacheco Boulevard. Village Sports carries a wide variety of skate gear and skate apparel, everything from your skate decks to your clothing. Um, they carry brands such as Huff, Bands, Thrasher, on and on. They also carry a wide variety of sports apparel, jackets, hats, beanies, all your new era fitted caps. Um, you can also, whether you're whether you're looking to get yourself a fresh white tee for the weekend or a pair of Air Jordan 1s, Retro Jordan 3s, he's also carrying a wide variety of easy boost um, and all your band shoes and needs. Um, go visit our friend James and make sure you check out his uh, Instagram at Village Sports. They also have a Patterson location located at 1040 West Las Palmas Avenue, Suite A2. That Instagram is Village Skate Shop, at Village Skate Shop. Hey, thank you, Village Sports. All right, cool. So we're, we're here with Tammy, mm-hmm. Tammy H., Tammy Hickman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you for doing this. Of course. First of all, yeah. um, so I've known Tammy probably at least for five years. Yeah. Um, I always see her with a positive attitude and a smile on her face. And she invited me to speak probably at the, the biggest speaking engagement I had done to that point. Um, where we hang out, it's an honor to get asked to speak places, right? And yeah. when she did this, it wasn't just your regular old meeting. It was like an event. Yeah. And I was like. The speaker jam. I was blown away. I'm like, oh, my God, they see value in me, right? Yeah. And and going through a lot of those feelings of self-doubt and everything, and, and I walked through it. And so, like, that was an honor for me early yeah. in recovery mm-hmm. and super grateful for that. Yeah. And um, just super grateful to know you and your husband you know thank you yeah thank you for being yeah. here when i showed up oh right. thank you yeah it's always an honor to be asking like this like all day long i've been like oh my god why me why me why me i think those insecurities always kick off whenever you get asked to do something you know like i don't have enough to say i'm not i'm not enough you know i think all of those come back to why we started doing the things we did you know at least for me was i i don't fit in i'm not enough so um i'm taking a deep breath like i had to do a prayer like okay i'm good i'm good now so thank you i appreciate it it's an honor i'm glad to be here and so um first of all i usually like to always start off asking people what's your clean date so my clean date is january 23rd of 2011 so i'm coming up on 12 years nice yeah and so what, what does that mean to you? So that's the day I, I stopped using, or that's the last day I used. Let's put it that way. So I don't think I stopped voluntarily. I think that's just the last day I could get my hands on anything before I went into treatment a couple of days later. Um, it's kind of mixed for me because <clears throat> that is a, uh, a year and two days after the date that uh, CPS went to the schools and took my kids. So it's almost for me like a, it's a day late and a dollar short. Yeah. You know, um, I always get really reflective around this time because I always think back to like where I was 12 years ago, you know, and um, I mean, I'm sure it's probably a lot we'll get to, but you know, 12 years ago I was, um, sitting in a house that wasn't ours Um, we were living with some people that had been kind enough to let us sleep in a room and uh, we were getting loaded and I wanted to kill myself yeah and and so um, you know and I I always talk about it because people that like watch this there's somebody that's viewing this that doesn't know you or I right they're probably like, these people haven't suffered like I suffered. Right. They don't know what it's like to be where I'm at. Yeah. So I always like to run it way back, right? Yeah. Because for people new in recovery or people that haven't experienced recovery yet, identification is a huge yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Um, so like what was what was life like for you like like growing up? Like was everything? So I grew up in Texas. Okay. I'm not originally from here. 
Uh, I grew up with a, a mom and a dad in the same house. Um, I did not grow up in a house where, you know, like people got loaded or not on drugs. Uh, I didn't grow up bad. I knew, you know, there was always food in the house. There was always the lights on. I didn't have to want for anything. Um, never had to worry about gas being in the car. Like I grew up, I grew up pretty good, yeah. you know. Um, I've got an older brother, but I think that for me, I think I was born an addict. Um, and I think that being born an addict for me, I think a lot of people, you know, not everybody believes that, you know, I do. <clears throat> and I think that I always distorted things in my mind. So I think that I always had mixed messages. Um, I never felt, again, like what I was talking about, like that I was ever good enough or ever enough. Um, I always felt like I was missing something. Um, my dad drinks. He has drank most of my life. And he was a hard man. Yeah. So very authoritarian. You would almost think he was military. So it was always like I was never able to reach what he wanted me to reach. And I strived really, really hard. And, you know, kind of that, like, you know, if I brought home all A's and a B, it wasn't like, oh, good job on the A's. It was like, why wasn't this an A, you know? Yeah. So, and, and I know that doesn't sound horrible. And, you know, it wasn't like I was beat. I was spanked. You know what I mean? I was disciplined. Um, I had this, the little, you know, I was held tight. But in my head, it was that I was never enough. Right. And so early on, I began seeking ways and people that I would be enough to. Got it. Right? So I became early on like a chameleon, like whatever you wanted me to be, I would be that to whoever would give me what I needed. Right? Usually men. You know, um, so if, you know, early on when I found somebody who I thought would love me, I would become whatever they wanted me to be. And so that happened, you know, quite often and usually unhealthy. And so by the time I was uh, 27, I'd been married and divorced three times. And this was without substances, you know, alcohol here and there, drinking here and there, because that was normal in my family. Um but, you know, 27, I had been brought out here by husband number three. I had two kids already, and um, and that's where I met uh, the man I'm married to now. And, and it's – when I hear these things, you know, and, and it's funny because I learned most of my parenting lessons through what I hear women share where we hang out, right? And so when I hear you talk about bringing that report card home to your dad, right? Yeah. That's huge. That's huge. Right? Like for somebody, they may, you know, because everybody's story coming up and trauma is trauma. Yes. Right? And yes. and I'm so, I try to be so careful with my daughters mm -hmm. because of hearing things yeah. like this. Right? And and you almost minimize that because where we hang out, that's not the worst thing you've ever heard. Right. Yeah. But to a child of that age, mm -hmm. that formed a lot of your behaviors yeah. moving forward. Yeah. I remember like, twice in my entire life my dad telling me he was proud of me like as a you know in my up until I reached like adulthood you know and I think the next time in an adulthood whenever he told me he was proud of me was whenever I had like a few months clean you yeah. know um that just weren't that wasn't his way it's not what he did you know now he tells me that whenever he's had a few to drink and then he calls me and he says you know I love you and I'm sorry and I was a bad dad and you know all of that. So um, that wasn't there with him. You know, he was, he was, he provided, he provided very well. And, um, you know, he w disciplined very well. Yeah. But that, that love that I needed and that I wanted wasn't there. And I think that as I, as I got into recovery, I began to realize because I really struggled with that for a long time. <clears throat> and I think that doing steps, you know, and understanding that, because in my opinion, um, he won't admit this, but in my mm -hmm. opinion, he struggles with the same disease that I do, Yeah, you know, and I think he did the best he could with what he had. You know, I'm a, I was a strong-willed child, you know what I mean? I, I argued back, I, I, I bucked the system, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and he didn't know how to deal with that. 
And so he did what he thought he was supposed to do. And then also, you know, with an addict mind himself. Right. So he did the best he could. It, and and I distorted all of those things. Yeah. And, and um, so and that led to like all these patterns yes. throughout your life that yeah. put you in certain situations. Absolutely. Um, and so you talk about, you know, uh, the multiple relationships and then ending up moving to California. Mm-hmm. So what does life look like at that time? Like, so life at that time is um, I'm coming out of divorce. Um, well, actually, so I'll just because we're here. Um, so I was married to uh, my son's father and his um, he was a Hickman and um, I was very unhappy in the relationship. And so um, my husband now, Bill, um, was his cousin and he moved in with us and we started formed a friendship and um, just really, you know, kind of got along really, really well. And um, I kind of kicked him out and my, and then Bill stayed. And uh, we have, we've been together for 25 years and on Sunday we celebrated 23 years. And uh, thank you. And, you know, love is where love is it just is you know what i mean and and, uh the heart wants what the heart wants and did i do anything right no but you know look at us now you know here we are and so at that time we're together things are you know things are well um i'm not using i had no clue about substances nothing i was not raised around anything um you know he on the other hand he had a history and so um, I had never even saw a joint till I was with him. And he was uh, rolling something one time for someone in the house. And I was like, what the heck is that smell? I had never even smelled. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, that's what this is. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you know. And um, still, you know, alcohol a little bit here and there, but nothing. And um, <clears throat> so our lives are good. Um, we end up uh, pregnant. And, uh, you know, I... I'd, We hadn't been married at that, you know, we didn't get married until we got pregnant. And then finally I was like, okay, you know, let's get married. So we went to Vegas. Um, We got married in Vegas and we ended up having this, uh, this beautiful little girl. At that time I had two children and he had two children. And then, you know, we have this, this beautiful little girl and, and um, we have this great house and um, everything's going good. Yeah. And so you touched on something. I don't think we've touched on it before in mm-hmm. the podcast because we talk about the disease of addiction, mm-hmm. not the disease of using drugs. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you talk about feeling like you were being born an addict. Mm-hmm. And so you experienced this trauma when you were young. And then so your disease was prevalent before you ever picked up. Mm-hmm. It, but it was in relationships. Yeah, right? absolutely. It was. Yep. And I think that's what people uh, the misconception about about the disease of addiction is the people think it's it's just drugs, mm-hmm. but it could show up yep. in behaviors. Yep, absolutely. Right? And yeah. so then now you have the relationship, mm-hmm. and now you're introduced mm-hmm. um, to marijuana. Yeah, yeah. Right? I didn't use it at that time, but I had smelt it. You know what I mean? But um, you know, just being just seeing things that I had never seen before. Um, I think that for me. And, and, you know, him having history of substance use, you know, he had used uh, multiple different, different substances. And so having those conversations, I was very curious. What was that like? What did that do to you? What, what did that feel like? You know, well, why did you stop? Why aren't you doing that anymore? And so in my mind, I was very curious. I had enjoyed alcohol. I did not like the after effects. I was very much, you know, drink a little, get tipsy, you know, do things that usually put me in really scary situations. So I didn't like that. Um, I, but I always liked that moment when I didn't feel like myself. Right. And so, so at the, at this point you would say it was almost recreational to a point. Yeah. And then when does that start to, to escalate? Right. I mean, so, um, we got married and, um, we had our little girl and it was actually December 4th of 2000. 
after we had had her. It was our wedding anniversary, and we were talking about it, and I said, hey, you know, I really want to try something. And um, he made a call to an old connect, and it was that night that we tried something, and I was like, yep, that's it. Right. That's the one I like. And I can, I can, I can identify. Uh -huh. There's a few dates I remember in my mm -hmm. head, and I have a date. Mm -hmm. Like we share, we share that. Mm -hmm. And so once you found that, it was just, it was still rec That was recreational for a while. Um, it was kind of this, like, we'll, we'll, um, we'll do this so we can be together. Right. Because like I said, he had two kids, I had two kids and then we had, you know, the baby and I was actually working. Um, you know, I was, I had a career. He had, he was working. So it was like, oh, we're passing each other in the halls. We're so busy, you know, all of this. And what we found was that we could, you know, do that and we could stay up all night and then have a little fun and then let it go for a month. Well, it's progressive, Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so pretty soon a month turns into every weekend and then every weekend turns into you know that monday you have a hard time getting out of bed and then next thing you know you're not getting out of bed for two or three days unless you got something and then pretty soon it's an everyday thing right yeah and then and then from that point forward life starts to get pretty unmanageable it gets pretty bad yeah and so um you know and so when we go from just recreationally using on the weekends and it starts progressing and progression. Mm -hmm. And so we often talk about the gift of desperation, yeah. right? So like I'd imagine that you and your husband get closer during that time and then things yep. fall apart, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, that keeps going. You know, I end up pregnant again. Um, we ended up, have, we have another baby and then, you know, it, it just keeps getting worse. And so we're into it about, about four years. Um, things are bad. We're getting evicted. He's lost his job. I don't have my job anymore. You know what I mean? Things get really bad. Uh, we end up having to move. Uh, I, we separate for a little while. We end up getting back together. Um, you know, he's not using at the time. I'm still using. Uh, I introduce it back to him. We go back another, you know, four years again same thing and it's it's you know same thing that happened before happens again you know where um and and I call it like what I usually call it is the um you know this this um this chaos you know what I mean it's like this this um you get comfortable in your chaos right and so it's we can't stand each other right and then you make the call and then all of a sudden you begin to like each other again, right? And then you get what you need and then everything's wonderful. And then you run out of stuff and then you're fighting and you're putting your kids through crap and you know, the I'm the bitch that needs to get the fuck out of the house and, and he's the asshole and, and you know, the cops are getting called and kids are seeing stuff that they don't need to see and, and, and it's just getting really bad and then you hate each other and then you make the call and then you like each other again. You know, it's just, but you're so comfortable in that chaos and you're so afraid to step outside of that because you don't know what outside of that looks like. Yeah. You know, that you're so sick with it that you'll stay stuck in that because you hold on to those moments when you like each other again and when you love each other again and when everything is good and everything's happy. Yeah. And so, so you're living in this cycle of insanity, yeah. right? And, and I think that's what like a lot of people don't understand about relationships, even toxic relationships, right? Yeah. You could see it from a mile away when mm -hmm. you're outside of it and you're like, what are these people doing, yeah. right? But like getting yeah. caught up in the scope of it yeah. is a completely different feeling because you yeah. just don't see a way out, yeah. right? And, and, you know, like I was taught in early recovery, you know, um, a human being could be a sack of dope with skin wrapped yeah. around it, right? And Absolutely. so, so right. this codependent relationship is building not only between you and another human being, but then the drugs mixed yeah. in, and there's and it doesn't seem like there's a way out of it, right? Absolutely. So, 
there's got to be a spark, right? Like, what is that point where things just explode? I mean. So, um, yeah, so for us, I mean, we had a couple of calls, you know, where cops came to the house. You know what I mean? Um, I always talk about, like, I feel like God, like, tapped me on my shoulder a few times. Yeah. And then he had to slap me in the face. <laughs> and um, And so, you know, a few of the taps were, like, cops came to the house. I had the house raided, um, <clears throat> things like that. And, you know, I didn't really pay attention to the taps. And then, uh, you know, one day we're, we're sitting at home and um, I get a text message from somebody that says, hey, I think your kids just got taken by CPS. So we had kids going to Schaefer School and we had two older ones. Um, so by this time we've got six kids. The two older ones, um, the oldest ones were over 18. They were out of the house. And then so we've got um, 15 and 16 and then we've got seven and nine so two are going to Schaefer, two are going to Buhack. And so I get a call from um, from the uh, high schoolers or someone texted me from there and said, um, hey, you know, my kid goes to that school and I think that your kids just got taken by CPS. And I was like, oh, man. So I, you know, I call Buhack and they're like, yeah, we can't tell you anything. You know, you've got to call you got to call the cops. So then Bill went up to Schaefer school and they just gave him a, like a police card and a CPS card, you know, so I'm calling, calling, calling. And finally at like five o'clock, you know, a CPS worker calls me and says, yeah, you've got court on Tuesday, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, your kids, you know, we have your kids, Tammy. And I was like, okay, you know, and the first thing I could think of was like my youngest, she slept with a yellow blanket and she has a purple monkey and she sleeps with those and she didn't have those that night. And I was like, you know, my baby doesn't have what she needs. And she'd never stayed a night away from us. Most times she was sleeping with us. You know what I mean? She just, and I remember my heart just broke because like she didn't have those things. And then I remember my next thought was I just want to fucking get high. Right. And, and I think that's what people, because maybe somebody listening to this would be like, well, then she got clean and everything turned around from that point forward, right? Yeah. It, and I know your story a little yeah. bit that that's not what it looked like. Yeah. Right. So no. this, the shame and the guilt. Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, so yeah. from that point forward, how long did it take you to actually get clean? So, um, again, m uh, my clean date is January 23rd of 2011. My kids were taken on January 21st of 2010. Right. So for a whole year, for a whole year, a year and two days. Yeah. So what was that gift of desperation for you? Like that moment that it clicked, like, I, I just have to change something. Oh, I mean, I'll be really honest with you. So I, I have, I have the day I, I, the last day I used. Yeah. Okay. But my truth is that really I have two dates, which is kind of funny because October 3rd is the date that I really surrendered. Yeah. Okay. October 3rd of 2011. And that's the date that their rights were terminated. Because I had a choice that day to decide what to do. You know, um, because anything before that was all about just faking it. Yeah. You know, I went into treatment because I thought I was going to lose my kids. And someone sitting in a circle with me, passing a pipe to me, said, hey, I know a place where you can go and they'll help you get your kids back. And she'd probably just gotten out of there, you know? Yeah, okay. And I mean, that's the truth. And, and, and God, this disease is so freaking sick, man. My full intention when I got there wasn't to stop using completely and forever for the rest of my life. It, I wish it was. I wish, I wished, let me change that. I wished more than anything early on in recovery that the day that my kids were taken, I would have turned my life around. But I can tell you today, that's not, I wouldn't change anything today. Yeah. Because of all that's happened in my life, the way that it is now, I know is exactly how it's supposed to be. 
but when I went into that treatment facility, it was strictly to get my kids back. It wasn't to stop doing dope. Yeah. And my whole plan, the conversations that my husband and I had were, we'll just stop <laughs> doing what we're doing yeah. and, and we'll um, get the kids back and then we'll just do it different. We'll do it better. Like, I'll only stay up one night. <laughs> you know, we'll get a lockbox, you know, yeah. we'll hide this stuff. We'll do it better. And, um, and thank God that changed. So would you describe that as like almost using against your own free will at this point? Yeah. You know, and that's, and I think that's what a lot of people that aren't on this side of it don't understand is the fact that we could so desperately want to change everything. But even when things are so bad, we can't find a way out because it's got that much of a grip. Oh, I, I can tell you that I, for so long, and I think that's why this time of the year is so, sometimes so hard because I remember sitting in that house that I was sitting in and I remember like there was no tree and, you know, here it was like almost Christmas and it was so sad and we weren't going to be able to see our kids for Christmas. Like we weren't going to be able to have them because it had been so long, you know, and I remember the CPS worker telling me like, you know, Tammy, your kids don't want to see you. And it was like, just those words were like, ah, you know, and, and she even said like, I'm surprised it's taken them this long, you know, to not want to see you. Like they don't want to see you. And, um, <sighs> that's tough. <laughs> and, um, and I remember just like sitting there and um, and and just dropping a rock and thinking, I am smoking my kids away. And like tears, just and just thinking, what am I doing? Like, why can't I stop this? Why can't I put this down? What's wrong with me? I'm just, I'm just a piece of shit. And remember thinking, like, I had a bottle of pills and just thinking I would be better off to take these. Like, my kids don't need me. They're better off without me. I'm just, I'm just a piece of shit. I'm just a dope fiend. They don't need me. Yeah. They're better off without me. Well, and it's crazy seeing you with your, so if, like, somebody walked by you in the store today, right, they would never think that was your reaction. Because I've seen you with your children, right, just to spin it back a little bit. And there's love there. There's a family there. Because I've seen you and Bill. The first time I think I met you, you guys had at least two of them with yeah. you, right? Yeah. Um, so now you've been exposed to recovery. Yeah. Right? So this gal that passed the pipe to you and gave you this brilliant yeah. idea, um, does that treatment facility start working on you? So I think that, honestly, I mean, definitely groups helped. You know, I'd never been exposed to anything like that. Yeah, D definitely. That was, you know, interesting to me. And I think that helped to start changing my concept. But I think I think what got me, you know, I was 40 whenever I went in. I'm, I'm I just turned 52. So was the little girls that were in there. And when I say little, I'm like 18, you know, yeah. and my girls were young at that time, you know, and I, I just. And they remembered being in foster care and going and seeing their mom at vis you know when their mom was there in tranquility and i remember just thinking like i can't have my girls and my kids come in here and be residents in this treatment facility like i can't i have to do something and so really that's what really made me go like and and stop and think and want to have that conversation with my husband like we have to change you know and then they there was a requirement then thank god there was a requirement then that i had to actually attend you know self-help meetings i had to start going to these places and i had never been to anything like that you know so i got to walk into these amazing rooms and and meet people that you know that said to me like you know you're going to get through this Right. So then you're exposed to, you know, 12 step recovery for yeah. the first time. Yeah. And, and you and now you say it's amazing. Yeah. But when you walked in there, were you carrying that? Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, for the, the first, you know, like I said, up until October 3rd, 
I seriously didn't think that I needed it. I did what I was told to do because that's what I do. Like I said, like I, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. Right. I, I, I can follow the rules. So, um, you know, so I, I followed the rules. I kept my head down. I did what they told me to do. I had an attorney who said, Hey, you know, you need to get a sponsor and you need to be on that fourth step by the time you go to court because the, the, the CPS attorney knows about four steps and we had already had our rights. I mean, our services terminated. So the next step is rights. And so she was like, look, this is last, last ditch effort. Like, you know, you got to get in there. And so she's like, do you have a sponsor yet? And I was like, no. And she's like, you need to get one. So, you know, I found someone because they do say, you know, find someone that has something that you want. So I found someone that had like, I don't know, she had like 15 years. And I went up to her and I was like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a sponsor. And she's like, can you read and write? And I said, yeah. She's like, do your first step. I was like, cool. So, um. I did it and, and I did, you know, one, two, and three and went over them with her and <clears throat> literally only did it because I was told not by the members, yeah. you know, I was like, please, I don't need this. <laughs> and, and literally only planned on doing just what I was told to do. And, um, and, and had already decided not to do, you know, drugs anymore, but really didn't feel like I would needed the program. Like I, I could do it on my own. Um, I just needed to do what my attorney said. So I started doing the steps and, um, and uh, got to that fourth step and and then we went to court and my sponsor went with me and she actually got on the stand and testified and and we had a friend there and um three of my kids four all four all four of the kids were in there and um you know my my daughters had been living with their aunt and uncle my husband's sister and um my son was living with a guardian and then our daughter uh, my husband's daughter was in foster care and um you know the judge had talked to him and and he said you know they don't they don't want to come home and um and i had almost eight months clean at that time and and he said you know it's commendable that you have that much time he said but unfortunately he said it's just too late and so he terminated the rights and uh You know, I walked out of there and it was like everything that I had been fighting for so hard. It was like, now what do I do? And, you know, my sponsor at the time, you know, she told me something that, that I'll never forget. And I really try to say this to every person that is struggling because it has literally carried me through years. And she said, you know, Tammy, she said, your children will find you. She said, but don't let it be in a gutter. And so is that... So, so you kept, you stayed clean still. Yeah. So what, was it those words or was it something inside of you or was it God himself or a combination of all three of those yeah. things? So I think it was a lot of, I think it was those. And I think it was also the fact that I had already done steps one, two, and three, yeah. even for the wrong reason, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's the really cool thing about step work is that it doesn't really matter why you do it, you know, whatever your motivation is. But when you sit down and you start taking a look and you start answering the questions or you start doing it the old school way or however it is that you do it, you're going to get something out of it, Yeah. even if you don't want to. So recovery was working you before you wanted to work it. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I think that day on October 3rd is when I finally said, you know what, um, there's a God of my understanding and he's kept me alive and this is for a reason i don't know what it is right now and i'm in pain and he's the only one that can make it better and there's a program that can help me with this right and that's really when i fully surrendered and said i know what's on the other side i know what's in a pipe and i know what's on the streets and i know that if i go that way i have a, a lot of yets that I'm probably going to end up doing. Yeah. And I don't know fully what's on this side, but so far it's been a little bit better. Yeah. I'd say it's a lot better. I'd say it's a lot better. <laughs> yeah. And it's gotten a lot better. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so from this point forward, um, so now we got eight months, you know, the kids still aren't around. No. You decide to stay clean. You're going to keep doing this thing. And so you and your husband are doing this thing together. Yeah. And so yeah. now what does life look like from that point? And, and how do you keep working in this direction 
when the greatest motivation you feel like is gone do you it was hard yeah yeah it was hard because you know people tell you all the time you know your kids are going to come back your kids are going to come back but you know what does that look like when they're not there and i gotta imagine you're seeing other people getting their kids yeah back. And that's got to be hard. I mean, yeah. I, I'm i not a perfect person, but I know if I was in your shoes, I'd be like, this motherfucker right here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That that was definitely a challenge. So one really good thing about, about you know, our lives is that we had so many children. You know what I mean? We had yeah. six. So one good thing is it kind of always felt like one was kind of always coming back. You know what I mean? So that that was one good thing. Um, you know, definitely the hardest were the two younger ones that had been adopted by the, by their aunt. Um, but we kind of always had one, you know, kind of coming back out of an oldest that lives in Texas. And so she reconnected and then, you know, um, our other daughter, uh, you know, she ended up pregnant. And so she gave us a grandchild, you know, pretty quickly. And then uh, a couple of years later, Bill's son reached out and then he gave us a grandson and, you know, um, and then my son, you know, started reaching out and like, it's funny because little memories pop up on Facebook and I'll be like, oh, you know, hopefully I'll get to have lunch with someone really special and I'll look at it. And it was like from six years ago. And I'm like, that's my, that's my son. And now he and I are like this, you know? And so, you know, kind of had these little moments of little things, but you know, there was, you know, there was a lot of birthdays and there was a lot of mother's days and there was a lot of, you know, Christmases and holidays that um, my heart was broken. Yeah, um, I hated Mother's Day for a really long time. You know, it it hurt. I wanted to go to sleep from October and not wake up until January because holidays were hard. But you know, the people in the rooms really helped um, a lot. We got to offer, you know, people would invite us. That's the thing about the rooms, you know, and the yeah. people because they are family. And so we would get invited for Thanksgiving. We would get invited to places for Christmas. Um, you know, I had people tell me, like, I'll celebrate, you know, your girl's birthday with you. We'll buy a cake and, you know, we'll do things like that. And, you know, people would just hug me and they would love me. And and they actually, you know, I had a lot of people who, who gave me hope when I didn't have any. Yeah. Um, and they said, you know, like, it's going to happen. You're going to, your girls are going to come back or your kids are going to come back. And so when I would get really defeated and, um, and when I would watch people, uh, sometimes that I felt were, and I hate to say less deserving or weren't deserving, um, it would be hard. You know, I've walked out of meetings because I've watched people get their kids back and then complained about it, you know, and, and I've had to come back in and say, you know, I would give anything to complain about my kids. Um, but it, now I know different because yeah. I did, you know, things happened well for me. And when my kids came back, I was not, I don't care how much work you do. You're not fully ready for yeah. that. You know what I mean? Parenting's hard no matter what. So, you know, I, I have to apologize for that now. You know what I mean? And so sometimes I have to look back and go, man, I was really, you know, that wasn't the best thing, best way for me to be thinking, you know, because yeah. it's tough no matter what you how old your kids are well that's what i always share and, and somebody's probably pissed off at me yeah. <laughs> you know because i always you know be careful for what you pray for yeah because you're probably gonna get it probably gonna get it yeah and then those blessings become your hardships yeah right life changes it does right and so how long does it take from that point from you getting clean to where you guys are actually reunited as a family so it took uh let's see bailey and maddie were adopted when they were 10 and 12 and um when maddie bailey moved back in when she was 18 the day she turned 18 so that was six years yeah so she so six years we were completely apart we did end up reconnecting we had some visitation um and that was a challenge um but she moved back in fully when she was the day she turned 18 she came home wow. and then <clears throat> maddie was 16 and we were uh we had taken we had gone to court and um you know the same court that terminated the rights gave us guardianship of her and so we were blessed to have her come back so at 16 and 18 we had a uh, you know six years later we had teenagers in our house 
Wow, that's when you and you get them at the toughest phase. Toughest phase. Because <laughs> I have a fourteen year old yeah. right now, and you know, yeah. and, and so, I mean, do you think that? I mean, obviously, that's the way things were supposed to go for yeah. you. So when people say don't leave before the miracle oh, happens, oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, that rings true for you. I yeah. mean, your story absolutely. is yeah one of perseverance because I don't know if that was my end goal if I could have held on that long. You know, it's, it's definitely hard. Um, it was tough. It was tough. And I think, but you know, I don't, I don't get loaded no matter fucking what, Right. you know, and that's something that I heard, you know, early on. And that's something that I live by, like, no matter fucking what, I don't get loaded. Um, and when my sponsor said like, your kids are going to find you, don't let it be in a gutter. Like that stuck with me, um, so much. And Man, you know, I think about that. And, you know, at, at 14, my girl, my youngest reached out to me on Facebook, and that's how she found me. And, you know, I think about that a lot of times. You know, what if I hadn't have been there? You know, if I would have been loaded, I would not have what I have today. Right. You know? We walk in your house, and it's you can tell this house is full of love. There's <laughs> stockings all over. <laughs> purple Christmas tree, right? <laughs> Tons of presents underneath the tree. Yeah. So, I mean, like. So now you're living this life of recovery. Like, what does that look like for you today? I mean, um, what what is what does Tammy's life look like today in comparison to what it looked like back oh, then? Uh, my life is full of I, my family is the most important thing to me. You know, we celebrate each other. Um, I think. Gosh, we're so strong. You know, we have had so, you talk about perseverance. I mean, just as a family, we have persevered so much, you know, when, when, um, you know, when our girls came home, like our 18, she's now, she's going to be 23. Um, she really struggled a lot. Um, she was pretty angry um, and didn't know if we were going to be there, you know. And I think that probably all of our children have struggled with that. Yeah. You know, just not knowing. And and that's absolutely valid for them um, because they were abandoned. You know, they were left. And I think that today, I think that they know that we're there, you know. Um, Bailey had a, a baby. He's 10 months old. And uh, for me, I think the coolest thing was, you know, that she called me one day, one night at like 3 o'clock in the morning and was like, I – I think I'm having contractions and, and I could get in the car and go over there. You know, right. that's, I get to do those things today. Like I can't even tell you how blessed I am. You know, my life is full of, I mean, we're a huge family. You know, you've got to think we've got, um, we have 12 grandchildren, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I mean, three of them live in Texas. I've got a daughter that lives in Texas. and um, But the rest of them are here, you know. And, and when we all get together, we're loud. And we are loving and supportive. And we don't take any crap off each other. And, you know, we, we know what it's like to not be together. Yeah. So that within itself gives us the ability to uh to just love each other so much yeah and so like i got to imagine besides that you have a lot of other things going on in yeah. your life too right yeah. i mean so like do you have a career now i do, do you... yeah i work for mercy county um i'm a dual diagnosis specialist so i get to work with mental health and um and substance use so i work a lot with the community uh homelessness the criminal population all of that. So I've had a few different positions. I've been working in the field of recovery since I got in recovery. Wow. So uh, I had the honor of working out at the prison uh, for about three years. And then I've worked in residential treatment too. So I've had a few different positions. So what is that process looking look like for you? So you're working in recovery while yeah. trying to maintain your own recovery. Yeah. I mean, the lines get blurred there. Is it difficult? So it did for a while, but, um, you know, step work's great. Yeah. Um, you know, talk about character defects and being able to 
set boundaries and know where your limits are and things like that. So I have the ability to do that. I have a great sponsor who helps me and, you know, calls me out on my crap and says, hey, I think you're doing this. I think you're doing that. And so I have the ability to, I work really hard to maintain those boundaries and to be able to say, you know, nope, I'm not doing that today or, you know, uh, and my husband's really good about helping me set those boundaries too. So, <laughs> and yeah. So, and, and another thing, because I'm, I'm a lot of, I, I see this theme a lot of people, of people losing kids and, and, and going through this process, trying to get into recovery. Yeah. What would you tell somebody that was, that's in that position to where like maybe CPS has stepped in, their life's completely unmanageable? Like, what does someone in that position do? Or what would you tell somebody that's in that position? I would tell them to to get into, you know, try to get into recovery as soon as you can. You know, do what CPS tells you to do. As You know, they've got a case plan. Uh, connect with CPS. Don't avoid them if you can. Um, using's not going to make it any better. I know it's tough. Reach out to people. Um, there are programs that can help. Um, it's hard. You know, it's really hard. The, the gosh, you know. If you can imagine, like, you know, you you use because you feel like crap most of the time, right? Yeah. And then you get the little people in your life that you love so dearly, and they get removed from you, and you feel horrible. And the only thing that makes you feel a little bit better is using. And it's so hard to not use. But I think the one thing I could tell you is, you know, it, it this too shall pass if you let it, you know, and, and if you do lose your kids, I'll tell you the same thing my sponsor said, you know, your kids are going to find you. They do. I, I know people that lost their kids at birth and, and 18 years later they found them, you know, don't let it be in a gutter. Yeah. That's like so powerful. Yeah. Right. And. And so, and, and even somebody beyond that, like somebody that's out there struggling right now, um, that doesn't see any hope, um, like what would you tell somebody like that? I mean, it may not even be the kids, it's just somebody out there using. Um, how do they get to where you're at, right? Like, how do they get there? Make a call, you know, pick up the phone if you've got one. If not, I mean, there's programs out there that can help. Um, go to a meeting if you can, you know, if you can find one. Go to a meeting. Uh, there's people around that can help. You got to think about what you want. You know, do you want to stop? That's the question. You know. Yeah. Well, and that and that's, um, you know, and, and like one other thing I, I was thinking about while you were talking, and, and I was having trouble finding a way to word it, is like so. So now that you're down the road, like, how do you mend those relationships with? Because I have a child that I got clean when she was seven. Right. And, and I just keep showing up no matter what, it. what it's to, you know, and I have one that's never seen me loaded. Yeah. Right. So, like, what is the rebuilding of those relationships look like and, and how much effort does it take on your part to get those kids to trust you again? I think that's it. You know, you just keep showing up. You know, when we got back into the girls lives, um, Bailey was working at H&W in Merced and uh, she bill would go up there and see her you know she um we went up there one time and and um we stood in line she was taking orders and we stood in line and we got up there and she turned away and i remember that broke my heart and um and so we got our order and we sat down and she didn't come out and talk to us and this was right at the very beginning just when we found out she was working there and so um so <clears throat> we left and we came back and uh, or no we left and so I told him next I said you know you just go up there I said you just go up there and, and it'll be okay and so he went up there and so she talked to him and so he told her he goes I'll be back next weekend and so he just kept showing up every weekend and then finally he asked her he said can I bring mom and she said yeah and so the following weekend I went up there and so she gave me a hug and we talked for a little bit and we went to walk off and she said, come back, come back next week. And the next week we went up there and the next week we went up there. And so we just kept showing up and today she'll talk about that 
every weekend she could count on the fact that we were going to be there. And I think that's what you do. I think you just keep showing up. And then I think the other thing is you let the kids guide you. Let them lead the way. Let them tell you what they want. Sometimes we push it too hard because we know what's in our hearts. And we want to make them understand we're not that person anymore, you know. But like with my son, I always let him set the pace. You decide what you want. You know, when you want to have lunch, call me. You know, but I'm going to tell you I love you every day. And um, that's one thing he'll say is, Mom, you let me set the pace. You let me decide. And I think that today, and literally like we're like this, and that's, I think, one of the things. So always show up, but let them set the pace on when you show up. See, that's perfect. <laughs> I think that's like a perfect place to leave it right there. <laughs> Just keep showing up. Keep showing up. Yeah. Cammie, I appreciate you so much for doing this Thank and letting you. us into your house. Um, and we'll end it like we are. Is there anything else you no. want to say before we? No, I'm good. All right. Yeah. So we got to end it with a hug. Yes, That's what we do. absolutely. That's yeah. That's what we do. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm.